Yeah. Before I begin, I just want to add my welcome to David's, um, to everyone here, including those who may be from the organs of public uh, safety. Um, is there anyone here from the FBI or Homeland Security? Please raise your hand. <laughs> well, they seldom do, but they're, but they're often here. But you're, you're equally welcome, wherever you are. Now, I, uh, I was thinking of trying to start on a little lighter note tonight, uh, partly because this is really dreary stuff, you know. Um, I found myself uh, driving down from the Bay Area of uh, California down to Fresno, which is about a three-hour drive. I was going to be on a panel there with Trita Parsi, who knows more about Iran than I'll ever hope to know, and some professor from the, the university down there. And I was thinking, what might I add? You know, uh, what what could I what could I add? Um, then I thought of this business about all the lies, and uh, and I thought of a song. That some of you, I see, some of you have some gray in your hair, or maybe even if you don't, you remember Porgy and Bess. It ain't necessarily so. <laughs> now, with apologies for fundamentalists, this is not making fun of the Bible. This is just the Porgy and Bess Gershwin rendition of, uh, for example, Oh, Jonah, he lifted a whale. Anybody knows the song? Please sing along with me. Yes, Jonah, he lifted a whale. He made his home in the fishes and dormant. Yes, Jonah, he lifted a whale. But, water, water, water. but it ain't necessarily so. No, it ain't necessarily so. They say, oh, Goliath, he lay down and dieth. But that ain't necessarily so. That seems so appropriate for all the claims that are being made about the weapons and, and weapons and tensions and all about Iran. So I had three hours and there wasn't much traffic, so I did a couple of verses that I hope you'll give me just a little time <clears throat> to, to try out on you and maybe you can you know, work in. Here we are. We did Jonah. We didn't they say oh Goliath. He lay down and dieth, but that ain't necessarily so. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, to claim he is bad is the fad. He said he would zap Israel right off the map. Mahmoud is a cad of a lad, but it ain't necessarily so. No, it ain't necessarily so. They say he would, he would zap. Israel right off the map, but that ain't necessarily so. And I think most of you know that that ain't so. He didn't say that. Okay. Next verse. Israelis, they sound the alarm. The Persians are building the bomb, but they ain't the kooks that do lust after nukes. So sit back and please try to be calm, cause it ain't necessarily so. No, it ain't necessarily so. They ain't the kooks that do lust after nukes. No, that ain't necessarily so. And the final, with your indulgence. Now, Obama, he tried to seem tough. He huff and he puff and don't bluff. In hopes Netanyahu will stop and shout, Yahoo! <laughs> and turn all his threats into fluff. But it ain't necessarily so, no, it ain't necessarily so. In hopes Netanyahu will stop and shout, Yahoo! And turn all his threats into bluff. Okay. <laughs> There's going to be some music later, and, uh, you know, the warm up uh, team is always picked to be, you know, to make the real team seem really good, so uh, I'm sure that, uh, that that's going to work tonight. Where do I begin? Um, it's another song, isn't it? Where do I begin? Um, I guess maybe I'll take a look. Yeah, 
what I had prepared here. <coughs> yeah, I had thought that since this is the 7th of June, 2012, that we really ought to be careful in marking occasions that need to be marked. And that is that 45 years ago, there was a war raging. Uh, Israel was under great threat from uh, Egypt, right? No, that ain't necessarily so. How do we know that? Well, don't believe me. Menachem Begin, the Israeli Prime Minister, admitted in 1982, look, the, the Egyptian deployments in the Sinai were no, th no threat to us. We have to be honest. We decided to attack the Egyptian, Jordanian, Syrian forces. That was in the New York Times, in the days when the New York Times used to carry straight factual reports. So don't let anyone tell you that Israel was under great stress or great threat at this time 45 years ago. It was not. It was fulfilling a plan that was developed many decades before, and the Germans had a word for, for it. It was called Lebensraum, an expansion of borders to give more leaving, living space to the Israelis. And of course, the occupied territories remain, most of them, under the domain of Israel for 45 years, longer than the Soviet Union occupied Eastern Europe. That's a long time, folks. Now, did we, did we condemn this war of aggression? We did. One of the few times we voted with the rest of the world to tell Israel that it had to withdraw to its pre-1967 borders that it would, would have to withdraw from the occupied territories. It's been a long time, folks, and they have not. It's just gotten worse. Now, not only that, but uh, I am reminded of tomorrow's anniversary, which is the anniversary of the attack on the United States ship Liberty. How many of you don't know about the USS Liberty attack? Wow, this is unusual. Let me tell you, what, I mean, this is great. I mean, it, it's unusually great. I know what kind of audience I'm addressing. Uh, let me tell you what happened to me out in Springfield, Missouri, five years ago. I was lecturing at a big church hall, about 300 people there, and Mearsheimer and Walt's book had just come out on the Israel lobby, the Likud lobby, more appropriately called. Um, and so, luckily, I had, it wasn't the book, actually, it was their, their major essay, which had been commissioned by the Atlantic magazine, but when they saw it, they said, oh, gosh, I don't know if we can, <laughs> if we can publish this. They couldn't get any American publisher to publish it. They had to get it published in the London Review of Books, and that's why they printed it out for, for reading on the plane. Luckily, I finished reading it on the plane, and when I was, uh, when I was, um, asked in the Q&A uh, what did I think of Mearsheimer and Walt and what they had to say about the power of the Israel lobby. I said, well, I, I thought it was right on. I thought it was very courageous. I'm not at all surprised that they couldn't even get it published. You know, Walt is a distinguished professor at uh, Chicago and Mearsheimer, no, Mearsheimer is at Chicago. Walt's at Harvard. These are big names. They couldn't get their article published. I said, the only thing that really surprised me about uh, their book, which is, or their, at that point, their essay, uh, which was designed to show the power of the Israel lobby, is that it didn't mention the most convincing, the most convincing incident that proves beyond doubt that the Israelis believe that they could get away with murder. And uh, I looked, and there was sort of blank expressions all, all around. So so I said, uh, this is, uh, I'm referring, of course, to the USS Liberty, the attack on the Liberty. And uh, there were a lot of very blank expressions in Springfield, Missouri. And I said, how many of you know about the USS Liberty? Three people raised their hands. One in the back, one in the middle, one pretty much up front. So I picked the one up front and said, sir, would you tell us uh, how you know about the USS Liberty? Sir. Bryce Lockwood, Sergeant, U.S. Marine Corps, member of the USS Liberty crew, sir. <laughs> uh, you know, I caught my breath. And I 
so, well, uh, Sergeant Lockwood, uh, would, you, would you be willing to come up and, and share what happened that day with the rest of the folks? Sir, I've not been able to do that. But it's, it's 40 years now, and I, I think I'd like to try tonight. And he came up, and for the next seven or eight minutes, gave the most moving first-hand account of what happened on that dreadful day, and how he lucked out by being in the uh, in between where his men were working with the intercepted uh, intercepted messages, and the rest of the ship in the bulwark, I guess to call it. He was going to drop the sensitive cryptological material into the bottom of the Mediterranean, and so when when the torpedo hit his men. He was just not unconscious, but wasn't destroyed like most of those 25 others. <coughs> when he came to, he was sent down to retrieve the ones that were left, and there were two still alive. He swam one back to, to the, whatever you call it, I was in the Army, not the Navy, uh, the little hatch that you got up, and it had closed. He banged, he opened it, and he got one guy up. And he was just about to get the other guy up when a wave came and he went out through the torpedo hole into the Mediterranean Sea forever. That was just part of the story. Um, so tomorrow is the 45th anniversary of that attack. And as you know, or most of you know, uh, our government covered that up, uh, that uh, the one very, very courageous young Texan from uh, the crew, his name is Terry Harbartier. Um, since the Israelis shot up their communications radar and the other equipment that they had on desk first thing, there was no way to communicate out, send an SOS. But Terry knew of a, of a loose uh, electrical plug that could be plugged into a non-working uh, message deliverer. And he asked permission to go across the napalm strewn uh, deck to plug that in and see if he could get that working. And the captain said, you sure you want to do that? He said, yeah. So he went and he plugged it in and he got an SOS off to the Sixth Fleet. Okay. Now the Sixth Fleet was told, one of your ships is under attack. It's the Liberty. Send help. And so the head of the Sixth Fleet, Admiral Geis, dispatched uh, fighter bombers from the USS Saratoga and the USS America. And they were halfway there when he was called on the phone from the White House. Secretary McNamara here, we understand you have dispatched some planes in the direction of Liberty. You ought to call them back immediately. Hmm. And guy says, I beg your pardon? Call those planes back immediately. You know what he says to McNamara? He says, I'm sorry. But I'm going to have to talk to your supervisor. <laughs> and guess what, folks? His supervisor was right there. OBJ gets on the phone and he says, Hey, Admiral, you call those planes back? I don't want to cause big problems for our major ally in that part of the world. Now, you get those planes back and get them back pronto. <coughs> That's what happened, folks. There are all kinds of witnesses to this. Um, Luckily, the Israelis didn't intercept the White House message, and so they thought the planes were still coming. The Israelis did intercept the SOS, and so they got the hell out of there right quick. Otherwise, they would have succeeded in sinking the ship and destroying all of the crew. When the wounded crew were let down in what lifeboats, the uh, torpedoes uh, from the uh, from the torpedo ships strafed them and uh, sank the uh, sank the lifeboats. So, uh, Terry Halbardier, by the way, was given a, a, a Silver Star Award in Central Valley of Texas, uh, Central Valley, California, three years ago, and I had the privilege of, of going to see that. He uh, had a congressman that's, that uh, bellied up to the bar, so to speak, and said, look, this, this action should be recognized. If it weren't for you, Terry, not only, not only 34 of your, of your of your crew would have been killed and 174 wounded, but the rest of them would have been as well. Now that's really important uh, because people need to know these things and except for this company, uh, very few people know the power 
of the Israel lobby and how it uh, really has the, the uh, well, uh, believes that it can get away with murder, witness the fact that 34 were murdered from the U.S. Navy, U.S. Navy, U.S. Congress, uh, John McCain's father, who had a, a, a role in the investigation that never happened, all of them covered it up. Not only that, but they told the crew that they were enjoined from speaking to anyone about what happened, even their wives. Okay? Now, you want to see PTSD? Wow. I, I had lunch with the folks that uh, celebrated Terry Harper Gay's uh, the Silver Star, and they were telling me what it was like not to be able to communicate with one another, not to be able to communicate what happened to their wives under pain of court martial. Uh, so these folks deserve every every uh, measure of respect. We always have a, a celebration, usually in Arlington Cemetery. This year was different uh, on the anniversary, and I've brought along and it's still in my car, but it's a little box of uh, explanatory pamphlets as to what happened that day and how we should honor these folks. So that's the Six Day War. We know that it wasn't begun because of provocations from Egypt. And we know about the USS Liberty. Now, what about the power of the lobby now? And why is it that, uh, that we're making such a big deal of what we know about the Iranian nuclear program? Our main thrust now, of course, is all right, Iran, this is your last chance to stop doing what we know you're not doing. <laughs> I'll say that again. This is your last chance, Iran, to stop doing what we can see you're not doing. Okay. Wow. Mm. Now, the president himself has, and the Secretary of State, all, all of those big dignitaries have referred to the, the nuclear weapons program of Iran. It's a lie. It ain't necessarily so. As a matter of fact, it's definitely not so. I don't know if many of you witnessed uh, the Face the Nation on the 8th of January, but uh, Panetta, Secretary Leon Panetta, Defense Secretary, was on there. And uh, he clearly, <laughs> the way these things work, you get together in the blue room, and Bob Sheeper says, well, uh, Leon, uh, what would you like to, what would we ask you today? And, uh, Leon said, ask me if Iran is working on a nuclear weapon, which place? And, uh, and she for, either forgets or he chickens out, okay? So here's Panetta toward the end of the, of the session. He looks at his watch, he says, oh, is Iran working on a nuclear weapon? No. <laughs> now, they were generally talking about Iran, but nobody asked him that question. He just wanted to put that down. No, they're not working on a nuclear weapon. Okay. Now, 10 days later, on the 18th of, um, of January, Ehud Barak, the Israeli Defense Secretary, was asked in an interview by Israeli Army Radio, uh, do you share the American assessment that Iran is not working on a nuclear weapon? Well, yes, they, they haven't decided yet because, you know, the inspectors are still there. Second question. Well, uh, how soon could they get one, get a nuclear weapon, uh, once they decide to, to, to go after one? Ehud Barak, it doesn't really matter. Because to do that, they would have to throw out the UN inspectors, and then we'd know to start counting. They can't do that without throwing out the UN inspectors. So relax a little, all right? <laughs> Ehud Barak. Israeli Defense Minister. Now, you'll you'll say, well, that's not what I heard about Ehud Barak, and it's not completely disingenuous because he says all manner of things, just like Panetta says all manner of things. Last week, Panetta said we're ready for war with Iraq, with Iran. Um, Ehud Barak is talking about, uh, you know, as soon as they make that decision, we're going to zap them. But what's what's the? Uh, I brought a whole a full, whole folder of uh, statements by by top officials that are self-contradictory or internally inconsistent, but I'm glad that I don't have to go through that file. It's kind of uh, morose and sort of boring, 
And you all know how many, how much uh, smoke has been blown about this problem. Um, we are in negotiations now. Um, probably it would be good to review the history of the negotiations. You remember that uh, candidate Barack Obama thought that it was silly not to talk to people even though they're bad people. He said, you know, if I remember correctly, we talked to the Soviet Union, the evil empire, and actually we achieved some pretty good arms control agreements with them, so I think we should talk to people even though they're evil, okay? <laughs> now, that seems sound sensible to the most of us, but it took